Okay, I'm settled down. I, I'm, I'm a little calm, I hope. Maybe if I breathe three times. Okay, now we're gonna take refuge in three jewels. The Buddha is like the the moon surrounded by the stars. The stars are the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. The Buddha with Buddha Amitabha in his heart. The Dharma, the realizations in the Sangha. Those who have attained realizations. Okay. It's a interpretation given in this book uh, the new eight steps to happiness okay oh so we went for refuge no we're going going for refuge why go to for refuge going for refuge to the three jewels is the gateway through which we enter Buddhism in general and generating bodhicitta motivation is the gateway through which we enter Mahayana Buddhism. Okay. What's the big deal in Mahayana Buddhism? Uh, okay. Uh, well, in, in religions that we uh, grew up in, like uh, Catholicism. Okay. The goal of Christianity is to make it to heaven. In contrast, Buddhism seeks to go beyond this and remove the objective altogether by seeking to eliminate all earthly desire, including heaven. Therefore, if successful, you achieve enlightenment and can enter nirvana. Sounds pretty easy, right? Not so. In most popular versions of Christianity, such as Catholicism, getting to heaven is actually really easy. All you need to do is repent and accept Jesus as your Savior at some point in your earthly life before you die. As a result, you can live a life of abject sin. As long as you repent on your deathbed, you are saved and you will still go to heaven. Or like if you're a, a baby and are about to die, if you get baptized, you get a ticket to heaven. However, you should think this over before you uncork your bottle and champagne and celebrate. In Buddhism many and many other religions, you actually need to do something meritorious to enter nirvana or heaven. In fact, in Buddhism, it is very challenging to enter nirvana, although it's teachings are easily explained. Fortunately, the Buddha and his disciples have developed concepts that are fairly easy to understand. One of the main concepts that a Buddhist is expected to understand and develop is the six perfections. Here's a list. Uh, it's found in Mahayana Buddhism. The six perfections. In order to become an enlightened being, you must first master these six perfections. The perfection of generosity, the perfection of moral morality, morality or moral discipline, the perfection of patience, the perfection of energy or joyous effort, the perfection of meditation or concentration, the perfection of wisdom. So uh, let's uh, go over here to uh, meditation. A Buddhist must break free of intense gravitational pull which is the sense of self. Therefore a Buddhist must develop unbreakable concentration. This is possible through meditation which hones concentration and prepares the individual for the final perfection, which is wisdom. Wisdom. The other perfections of generosity, morality, patience, energy, and meditation, you have to, it sounds like it's saying that you have to develop those bef first before you get to uh, really gain wisdom. Without the perfections of generosity, morality, patience, energy and meditation it is not possible to understand wisdom indeed the final perfection is not an intellectual form of wisdom wisdom the accept is the acceptance of emptiness which is 
accepting that no objects or beings have a self essence uh, this is from uh, the website buddha statues now.com <laughs> wonder what what that uh, website is all about buddhas amitabha buddha oh amitabha oh they sell they sell uh statues buddha buddha statues okay can you see it we have to uh, brighten it up oh is it, it was it was dark now you can see it right well it doesn't matter so i hope you uh you got the sense of the importance of going for refuge and then generating bodhicitta did i explain that okay hmm okay so going for refuge to the three jewels is the gateway through which we enter buddhism in general and generating bodhicitta meditation is the gateway through which we enter mahayana buddhism but within uh generating bodhicitta the six perfections are mentioned see see the prayer for generating bodhicitta through the virtues i collect that's the merits by by practicing the six perfections it it's it uh mentions them briefly by by giving which is the perfection of generosity and other perfections that's the other five through those virtues or merits that i that i uh collect may i become a buddha for the benefit of all through the virtues i collect by giving in other perfections may i become a buddha for the benefit of all so did i go for refuge and the three jewels oh okay here's the refuge prayer i and all sentient beings until we achieve enlightenment go for refuge to the buddha dharma and sangha i and all sentient beings until we achieve enlightenment go for refuge to buddha dharma and sangha i and all sentient beings until we achieve enlightenment go for refuge to buddha dharma and sangha at least three times um so but what do we think while we do that uh so <clears throat> having calmed our mind uh, we now go for refuge to the three jewels the three jewels are the buddha jewel there's the buddha jewel all fully enlightened beings the dharma jewel there's the dharma jewel not simply the teachings but the spiritual realizations developed through practicing the teachings and the sangha jewel mm, that's the superior practitioners who have realized ultimate truth directly so we have to also generate a uh, a motivation so with strong fear of samsaric rebirth and with deep faith in the power of the three jewels to protect us we recite the refuge prayer and make a strong determination to rely upon buddha dharma and sangha until we attain enlightenment so now that we've generated Uh, bodhicitta and gone for refuge uh, we can begin meditating actually there's some other things we have to do before meditating uh, visualize the field for accumulating merit uh, in offering the seven limbs and the mandala mm, that's a prostration offering confession rejoicing beseeching the holy beings to remain requesting the turning of the wheel of dharma dedication oh, okay we can do these at the same time that we meditate on this book on the, on the let's see this is uh the book by jack Kerouac called wake up a life of the buddha uh it's got an introduction by uh, Bob Thurman and he mentions that 
the when he was a teenager he uh, uh, was familiar with Jack Kerouac through uh, I don't know if it was this book but ah it was the Dharma bombs so that was uh, some 50 or so years ago that he read it so that it must have influenced him to take up Buddhism or consider it there were others that influenced him at that time because he read uh, he read books by Nietzsche Schopenhauer Kant Wittgenstein Henry Miller Herman Hess Freud Jung Wilhelm Reich Lama Govinda D.T. Suzuki Evan Wentz and so on uh, he says that he, when he read the Dharma Bums as a teen in the late 50s I was exposed to perhaps the most accurate poetic and expensive evocation of the heart of Buddhism that was available at that time not to say that it was perfect or pretend that it would be able to tell a, if it was a or pretend that I would be able to tell if it was or wasn't it's just that it is so incredibly inspiring and must have deeply affected my 17 year old self in 1958 the year it was first published in the year I ran away from Felix Exeter Academy and went looking for a revolution so uh, and then um, so he's got a long introduction uh, where he says how wonderful this book is I guess and uh, some insights into the book okay so Uh, so th this book um, he says in the uh, introduction uh, Jack Kerouac says may I live up to these words to sing the praises of the lordly monk and declare his acts from first to last without self-seeking and self-honor without desire for personal renown but follow what the scriptures say to benefit the world has been my aim, Ashvagosha, first century A.D. And he also, uh, let's see, let's see, did, 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 did. oh, he mentions that that this book contains quotations from sacred scriptures of the Buddhist canon. Some quoted directly, some mingled with new words, some not quotations, but made up of new words of my own selection. So the storyline follows Gautama Buddha's life as represented in Ashvagosha's Buddha Charita and in Narasu's Life of the Historic Buddha that he put some adornments and rearrangements. And in essence, the heart of this book is an embellished presence of the mighty Surangama Sutra whose author who seems to be the greatest writer who ever lived is unknown <laughs> he lived in the first century AD and drew from the sources of his own time and wrote for the sake of brightest divine enlightenment so the purpose of this book is to convert so I hope it can convert me <laughs> let's see okay so let's start reading here is where it starts it doesn't even have a, a chapter uh, heading there's no chapters in it. We just start writing. Uh, so let's let's read uh, a few pages here, and then we'll leave. We'll wrap it up. Buddha means the awakened one. Until recently, most people thought of Buddha as a big, fat, rococo sitting figure, with his belly out, laughing, as represented in millions of tourist trinkets and dime store statuettes here in the Western world. People didn't know that the actual Buddha was a handsome young prince who suddenly began broodings in his father's palace, staring through the dancing girls as though they weren't there. At the age of 29, 
till finally and emphatically he threw up his hands and rode out to the forest in his war horse and cut off his long golden hair with his sword and sat down with the holy man of India of his day and died at the age of 80 or so to as a lean venerable wanderer of ancient roads and elephant woods this man was no slob like figure of mirth but a serious and tragic prophet the Jesus Christ of India in almost all of Asia the followers of the religion he founded Buddhism the religion of the great awakening from the dream of existence number in the hundreds of millions today few people in America and the West realize the extent and the profundity of religious establishment in the Orient few people know that Korea Burma Siam that's uh, Thailand Tibet Japan and pre-red China are predominantly Buddhist countries as the United States England France Italy Mexico may be so predominantly Christian countries so this young man who couldn't be tempted by a harem full of beautiful girls because of the wisdom of his great sorrow was Gotama, born Siddhartha in 563 BC prince of the Shakya clan in the Gorakhpur district of India his mother whose name curiously was Maya which in Sanskrit means magic died giving him birth he was raised by his aunt Prajapati Gotami. As a youth, he was a great athlete and horseman, as befits a member of the Kshatriya, the warrior caste. Legend tells of a sensational contest in which he bested all the other princes for the hand of Yasodhara. He was married at 16 to the princess Yasudara, who bore him a son, Raula. His father, the Maharaja, Maharaja, Maharaja Sudodana, the Maharaj Sudodana, 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 Sudodana. Devote, no, doted on him and plotted with his ministers to figure out ways to please him and take his mind off the deep sadness that grew and grew as he neared thirty. One day, riding through the royal gardens of the chariot, the prince beheld an old man tottering in the road. What kind of man is this? His head white and his shoulders bent, his eyes bleared, his body withered holding up a stick to support him along the way. Is his body suddenly dried up by the heat, or has he been born this way? Quickly turn your chariot and go back. Ever thinking on this subject of old age approaching, what pleasures now can these gardens afford? The years of my life, like the fast flying wind, Turn your chariot and with speed wheels take me to my place. Then on seeing a dead man being born to his beer nearby, the followers are overwhelmed by grief, tearing their hair and wailing piteously. Is this the only dead man or does the world contain like instances O oh, worldly man cried the unhappy young prince prince behold everywhere the body brought to dust yet everywhere the more carelessly living the heart is neither lifeless 
wood nor stone, and yet it thinks not all is vanishing. Mm. That night, on orders from the king who'd heard of this, Udai, the king's minister, commanded the girls to entice, entice Prince Shuddhartha with their charms. They made many winsome moves, dropped casual shoulder silks, snaked their arms, arched their eyes, danced suggestively, caressed his wrists. Some even pretended to be blushingly confused and removed roses from their bosoms, crying, Oh, is this yours or mine, youthful prince? But in his mindfulness of woe, the prince was unmoved. At midnight, the girls were all exhausted and asleep on various divans and pillows. Only the prince was awake. It is not that I am careless about beauty, he spoke to the dark questioning minister. Or, an ig or am ignorant of the power of human joys, but only that I see on all the impress of change therefore my heart is sad and heavy if these things were sure of lasting without the ills of age disease and death then I then would I too take my fill of love and to the end find no disgust or sadness if you will undertake to cause these women's beauty not to change or wither in the future then though the joy of love may have its evil still it might hold the mind in thraldom to know that other men grow old and sicken and die would be enough to rob such joys of satisfaction yet how much more in their own case, knowing this, would discontentment fill the mind to know such pleasures hasten to decay and their bodies likewise? If notwithstanding this, men yield to the power of love, their case indeed is like the very beasts. It is but to seduce one with a hollow lie. Alas, alas, Udai, these, after all, are the great concerns, the path of birth, old age, death, and disease, the pain of birth, old age, disease, and death. This grief is what we have to fear. The eyes all see, see all things falling to decay, yet the heart finds joy in following them. Alas, for all the world, how dark and ignorant, void of understanding. And he made this vow. So the Buddha is going to take a refuge vow, a bodhisattva vow. I now will seek a noble law, unlike the worldly methods known to man. I will oppose disease and age and death and strive against the mischief wrought by these on man. To do this, he resolved to leave the palace for good and go meditate in the solitude of the forest, as was the custom in those days of natural religion. And he pointed out the sleeping girls to Udayi, for they were no longer beautiful with their lamentable tricks laid aside snoring sprawled all over in different ungainly positions mere pitiful sisters now in the sorrow burning uh, globe 
when the king heard of his son's decision to leave home and take up the holy life, he protested tearfully. But the young monarch said, Oh, place no difficulties in my path. Your son is dwelling in a burning house. Would you indeed prevent his leaving it? To solve doubt is only reasonable. Who would forbid a man to seek its explanation? And he made it clear that he would rather take his life than to be held by filial duty to go on in ignorance. Whoa. He he would rather take his life than to be held by filial duty to go on in ignorance. Whoa. This is a uh, counter many uh, religions in a way. Because in uh, in Confucianism there is uh, the duty, uh, the filial duty, and and in the Hinduism, there is uh, following the Dharma. In this case, in Hinduism, it, Dharma doesn't mean uh, Buddhist teachings, but Dharma is more like duty. Uh, and uh, caste duty like if you're born in a warrior caste uh, you, you're you a soldier and, and it is your duty to fight in wars and that's what the Bhagavad Gita is about uh, I think and, and, and this idea was introduced to me by a professor at a university or a college I'll have to look him up again he says uh, that the reason for the Bhagavad Gita itself which is a, a few uh, section of uh, 18 or so chapters inserted into the Mahabharata the Mahabharata is is an epic bigger than Homer's Iliad and Odyssey perhaps uh, it's huge but within it uh, uh, some somebody or some people inserted the Bhagavad Gita in the before the Civil War started and uh, let's see the it's a conversation between a guru and disciple. In this case, it's Krishna is the guru and disciple is a... I forgot his name. Is it... Uh, it starts with an A. Is it Ananda? <laughs> anyway, so... Well, basically... He does, uh, Ananda, the disciple doesn't want to fight and Krishna is uh, there to tell him that uh, it's your duty and besides uh, you're not really going to be killing anybody because you really can't kill their souls, their essence. So nobody is really born or dies. So do your duty. Okay. But here, the Buddha says, uh, I'm not going to do my duty as a prince, of a, uh, as a kshatriya, which is a warrior class. I'm going to give up my duty and, and seek uh, the end of suffering, the end of uh, ignorance, wisdom. You know, I'm going to... So he says... He would rather take his life than to be held by filial duty to go on in ignorance. So he's going to end ignorance, which 
is uh, related to the cause of suffering. Okay, so there I'll stop. Put a marker there. Uh, so, uh, who, uh, we got a sense of, uh, the drama of, uh, the prince that is about to make a career change. That he is, uh, very disillusioned about life, even though he's a prince and, and he's got everything. So that happens to many people, and they uh, they seek a career change to something more fulfilling. And it looks like Buddha's or or Prince Siddhartha's uh, uh, career change will mean um, that Buddha that he will become the Buddha, that he will leave the the palace and to become um, a hermit, uh, a wanderer, homeless, mendicant, a monk, as it was often done in those times of natural religion. So there you go. Uh, uh, may this, uh, so I should dedicate the merits. Well, I hope, as, as Jack Kerouac says, let's see, where does he say? In the beginning or in the introduction? May, he writes this and he says, May I live up, by doing this, may I live up to these words to sing the praises of the lordly monk and dedicate his acts from first to last without self-seeking and self-honor without desire for personal renown but following what the scriptures say to benefit the world has been my aim so my main aim here is to benefit the world mm, well I should try that it be my aim but uh, I'm just benefiting myself okay so if I have benefited myself May I renounce that benefit, that uh, accumulation of merit. I renounce it and give it away. Give it away. Give it away. Give it away to all sentient beings, all these uh, dead souls here. Uh, the, the spirits that are around here listening to this. So I give all the good karma the merit that I have accumulated and I'm giving it away to all the spirits around me oh my home oh my home um tare tu tare tu risoha um tare tu tare tu risoha okay thank you if you made it this far that's pretty amazing Yeah.